Welcome in, everybody. RFK Refugees podcast. Ted here, John here, and uh, this is a special preseason edition show we're giving you guys. Uh, we are joined by the wonderful, um, except for the team he supports, obviously. Got to get that <laughs> part out of the way. But the very wonderful and uh, always available uh, Mark Fishkin from the Seeing Red podcast. Mark, thank you so much for joining uh, you, I will now give you, you can rag on DC if you would like. I will give you that. Since I went on your team, you can you can come on, you can rag on my team. Which is very uh, easy to do right now, let me tell you. <laughs> you know, uh, we, we have an, uh, the, an even number of MLS Cups uh, in the last, what, 18, Oof. 19 years now? So <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a good one, right? Yeah. We can use that. Mark, you've been on the show a couple times now, and I want to make sure... You guys have been around. I was just on your website just to try to get an idea how long you've been around. You've been around since 2010. Is that right? Yeah, this is our 15th season. We uh, we launched when the arena opened in 2010. That's so, amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I had brown hair this morning, though, so I don't know what happened uh, <laughs> with that. But, yeah, no, uh, it's it's been a long time. We've recently made the, the jump to video as well. And, uh, yeah, no, we're, we, we're still having fun. There's still lots to talk about every week. So it's we just keep going. Just keep it, keep it going. You, that's what you've we're been... all trying to do. We're all trying to match your, your. <laughs> that's a, that's a long, a long bar to reach. So we're going to keep trying. It's not a contest, but yeah, it's, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a minute for sure. Well, Mark, thank you again so much for coming on. Um, let's go ahead and jump right into it. Part of the reason we asked you on this time, we waited. We we waited even like a little longer than we thought. Uh, if, if if you're new to the show, you might not know we had Mark Fishkin on when uh, it looked like uh, Chris Armas was a finalist way back in 2021. I want to say I maintain yep. we killed that Ted. I maintain <laughs> that the front office heard our podcast making fun of them. They're like, back it up. Never mind. Yeah, no. that is, it was reported by the Atlantic, the Athletic, that the the owner had heard like the pushback and started to back away from the deal. I'm just saying. Yeah, just saying. We were... I think the Mark Fishkin report on uh, RFK refugees. They're like, this is this is we're gonna scuttle this. No, this is no good. clearly not. This is not what we want to be doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> so we waited. This until this will go a lot. This will go a lot smoother. I promise. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. and hopefully, hopefully they don't hear this and say, "Hold on, wait a minute, we need That's to right. He's out of back here. up." Otherwise, we'll, we'll doubt our, we'll, we'll uh, question our powers here real quick. Uh, but uh, but let's get into it. Uh, we, DC United hired, of course, uh, Troy Lassane, who um, was the coach for uh, the New York Red Bulls last season. Um, I, I guess I'm gonna just kind of open it up. I'm gonna open up with your comment, which was, "I, I, you know, made the made the joke. Well, you know, let's make sure this is official before we will welcome Mark on to." To give us all the thoughts of analysis, <laughs> and then the show gets kind of lost to time. I mean, if a Colorado podcast wants to come in and borrow that, they're welcome to. Let me just <laughs> put that out front. Uh, but That's... wanted to wanted to speak your thoughts. You said that any team would be lucky to have Troy Lassane. I wonder if you can kind of, you know, give me a, a cliff notes, whatever version you can. Where, where does that come from? I guess what what did you see overall in in his time there that makes you think, uh, you know, he's he's got what it takes to be a a talent, a great MLS coach. Yeah, l- l- let me first say that, um, you know, Troy was given the job at a time when the team was really at a nadir of the last few years earlier in the 2023 season. They had uh, just just to set the stage, they had brought in Dante Van Zier, um, who during a match against San Jose made a comment that was. Uh, and, and I don't know firsthand because I wasn't on the field and it's never truly been reported as such, but he said a comment that um, African-American players on the team took really badly. Now, I believe that there was a cultural miscommunication about a word that was said and the meaning behind the word that Dante had said in the heat of the moment. Um, but Gerhard Struber, who was... Uh, the coach of the team and had been the coach of the team since really all through COVID 2020 uh, into 2023. And who we all thought was, uh, you know, kind of not long for the team anyway, because they started out with one win in 11. Um, this incident where he kept Van Zier on the field for 20 minutes while the, the refs and VAR and everyone was trying to find audio or visual evidence of what was actually said in any, in any case, it was a really bad time. Like, it was just a bad time. And um, Lassane was elevated when when um, her Struber was let go, and he had a mission, which is turn it around, right? Now, we all know that MLS is a very forgiving league and that you can kind of figure it out halfway through the season and with the right results get to where you want to go. But um, 
Troy did not just get the team over the playoff line for the for the you know 13th straight year um, by winning with the latest decision day goal I think any of us had ever seen. They needed a 95th minute penalty at Nashville to to get to the playoffs, but he really changed the culture of the team. And when I think about the role of a head coach, it's yes to go out there and get results and to maximize the resources that you were given. Red Bulls in 23 played the entire year without Lewis Morgan, their team leading scorer from 2022. He had a very young team because all Red Bull teams are relatively young. He got no help, no help in the summer transfer window. And he was able from the first moment he was given the reins to have the team believing that they were going to make the playoffs. Remember, they had won one of their first 11. Um, this team had a run to the round of 16 in the Open Cup, losing in penalty kicks to, to FC Cincinnati. They had a run in the round of 16 in the League's Cup, losing to Philadelphia in penalties. And they were, you know, they wound up going to the, yes, it was technically the first round of the playoffs, but the team pretty much played knockout matches throughout the entire month of September and October just to get to uh, the, the playoffs. And so he is, uh, you know, not to give the entire interview away, but he's a, he's a tremendous individual. I mean, he is, he is a guy that makes it very, very easy to believe in. And, um, and you guys are fortunate to have him. He's a, he's really a truly wonderful person. I think the question that everyone had after sort of seeing that turnaround and seeing that run and seeing the playoff uh, appearance is what was wrong with him? Why didn't, why, what was, what, what was, what could have possibly been the reason for this team that had seen a almost, I don't want to say unprecedented turnaround, but quasi miraculous turnaround from one from 11, as you said, what is the sort of speculation? I don't, I don't imagine there's, uh, you know, the, the publicly stated reason is probably just we just decided to go a different way. What's the what's the thinking on why the team might have gone in a different direction? Yeah, I mean, I asked uh, Red Bull head of sport, Jochen Schneider, straight up during the end of season presser. What what more could uh, Lassane have done? And he was very quick to say nothing. He, he had done everything that they had wanted and more. But I think after a period for the Red Bulls, really since the 2018 Eastern Conference Finals, where they famously failed under Chris Armas at, uh, at Atlanta at a time where they had won their third shield, it's really been kind of four or five seasons uh, in the wilderness for this team. And while, you know, New York is never going to be Miami and there's only one Leo Messi, um, the team really hasn't had any named players in the interim. Um, it's been mostly youth players, uh, young DPs, not using all the DPs that, that we are allotted. And signing a player like ML Forsberg, who, uh, you know, is certainly not the biggest name the team has ever had, but he's a really solid signing. I mean, this is a nine year Bundesliga vet, um, he's a Swedish national team player. He, and and for Red Bull, he is old. I mean, he is 32, which is as old as, you know, Monsieur Henri was when he came to the Red Bulls. But they haven't spent money on a 30-year-old plus player in a long time. The point I'm trying to make and taking a little while to get there is I just think that the organization thought they wanted an experienced European coach to advance the team, you know, past four straight – or five straight first round playoff exits. And, you know, whether or not they continue to sign more quality talent uh, remains to be seen in Red Bull land. And a lot of people are getting a little twitchy because we're a month away from the season. And they, you know, Forsberg's a big signing, but they really need more and <laughs> to be considered a contender, right? And, and in 2024, everyone's going to be chasing Miami, whether, you know, until all of their legs fall off in the middle of the summer in South Florida. So, you know, so back to your original question, I don't think there's anything that he could have done. I, I, you know, if they had won MLS Cup, it probably would have changed their thinking for this next hire. But Troy has a tremendous runway ahead of him. Uh, Zach Prince, who's also joined um, Troy's uh, 
you know, assistant coach roster with you guys is also a terrific guy, really sharp. And he's, he's just a person that believes in people and he really empowers people to feel a connection. So, um, as as difficult as it will be, because I certainly will not be rooting for TC United, I will be rooting for the <laughs> thing. That's a good that's a good way to put it. Um, uh, I wanted to ask. Uh, you talked a lot about how you know the Red Bull philosophy. You know, the, this Forsberg signing has kind of been a change, and and you know the team itself. Uh, I I have to say, I have to give hats off to your so- director of soccer because. Um, I feel like that's been, I was somebody's director of soccer operations. Uh, I feel like that's been missing from DC when he was like, look, it hasn't been good enough. Um, I feel like I've wanted them to say that forever. I've wanted them to be like, come on guys, this is clearly <laughs> not good enough. You can, you can only polish this turd, but so much, uh, until you, you guys really need to come out and say it. And I think we've gotten maybe a ca- a little bit of an admission now, you know, in interviews we've seen, but, um, but you talk about the team sort of having youth players, you know, pushing youth, pushing development for the longest yeah. time, you know, signing young players. Is there something maybe I'm, we, I think one thing I have felt, you know, maybe this won't work in a New York soccer market, but I think in a DC market, you know, we talk about players that grow, we grow, we talk, you know, we all talk about Bill Hamid. Yes. Okay. We, we, you know, we talk about Rooney, but you know, even in our other sports, you know, Alex Ovechkin, um, you know, any of the whatever quarterback draft pick is coming through that the, the commanders <laughs> fans talk about. So I feel like in right. this market, we're we're very prone to having guys that we, you know, that we develop and grow and we get to sort of see grow. So I felt for years that the, the route DC should go is Lesane maybe that type of coach that you could see. And, you know, they have the video of him with the academy as well. Is he in his sort of season and a half? Did you see him, you know, maybe give opportunities to younger players, maybe if an older player is not performing rather than just saying, well, he'll figure it out saying, well, let me see what I have, you know, from my, you know, Academy. And again, short time frame, maybe you didn't see it, but I'm just curious yeah. if maybe that's what DC well, saw. Right. Well, you know, I think the answer is yes. And, you know, again, the, the notion that Red Bull had Red Bulls had older players to even throw out there, I think is a bit of a joke there. Treme- you know, traditionally, uh, certainly during this kind of interregnum, since the team has been a contender in the league, they've had one of the youngest rosters in the league. And I mean, even now their current roster, and while yes, it includes their f- official first team roster, has an average age of 22. And so, you know, a lot of detractors of the team will say, well, it's a, it's a U23 team. And, and it is. I mean, um, you know, you think about guys like Lewis Morgan, who's coming back. He's 27. And when, when speaking to him about, well, you know, you're, you're one of the older players on the team. And he's like, I am. I guess I am. Right. You know, you can look at the you can look at the growth of a player like John Tolkien, who, while he certainly didn't cover himself with glory and glory against Slovenia the other day, you know, he he still believes that he has got a shot of, of making the 2026 World Cup roster. And for me, Lassane's impact on him and letting him be him, because he's such an idiosyncratic guy, like he is really like marches to the beat of his own drummer, but he has leveled up in such a massive way uh, at left back under under Lassane. And he would be the first to tell you that, right? That, that um, he, he allows young players to be leaders on the team, right? Players like Danny Edelman, another homegrown, uh, you know, number six, who was the captain of the U-20 uh, national team that went and played in the U-20 World Cup. Um, you know, players like a, like a Cam Harper, who's kind of a trainer player who came to the Red Bulls, you know, uh, right at the start of 2020 before the pandemic had kind of washed out of Glasgow Celtic. And he, you know, while he wasn't certainly an everyday starter, he would come on and really, really impress um, young players, even like a Frankie Amaya, who, while he's been in the league for a hundred years, he's 22, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, and he came to New York kind of with his tail between his legs. He had, he had a really bad experience at FC Cincinnati where he was their first ever number one draft pick. And it was a lot of pressure. He's a really shy guy. And he became an everyday starter, not at the position that he was signed to play. He right originally came into the league as a 10. He's not an MLS 10. He's an MLS 6. And so uh, you kind of drawing out and, and building. And, and again, you know, you had mentioned the academy, Ted. Kind of the entire ethos of the team now, and we're just about to break ground on 
uh, their second and larger training complex, um, which also speaks to, sorry, sorry, sorry for the, the I know, I know, <laughs> good, I know, I know, I know. Um, but you know, to truly really integrate, you know, to have the U 12s having lunch next to the first team players to really be able to show everyone, you know, we're united as a team, the U, the Red Bulls U 15s won the MLS next i guess mm-hmm. cup at that age group and he was so important to that those group of guys making sure that they knew that he was watching them and actually signed a number of those guys julian hall uh, aiden stokes are two kids from the u15s that got signed the first team contract so you know i think he's definitely a guy who understands the value of an academy and really looks to you know focus the entire organization toward a common goal. And he's really the type of guy that can do that. I don't know what you're talking about. Having state of the art facilities two mm-hmm. massive sheds out in the, <laughs> in the middle of a uh, lot County is a, is a far superior training facility. Mm-hmm. Don't you're talking about John, uh, you yeah. can go next with your, with the question. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, you, you mentioned sort of like the dynamic of having a coach that's so driven on advancing young players, almost by necessity also, but what, what the roster was, I think, yeah, a lot of DC United fans are looking at this hire and saying, well, Messi and his ilk are not walking through this door. No. So if, if we're going to succeed, it's going to be on the back of these four or five young players that have a decent pedigree. So it makes sense if you look at that from a perspective of this is a guy who builds from the bottom and middle of the roster. He's going to elevate those people, allow them to take leadership roles. My concern, and I guess you really hadn't had this problem in New York just because of the roster. I am slightly concerned about how players like Christian Benteke and Mateus click buy into a player who I am not calling Ted Lasso, but like he has like a Pete Buttigieg vibe in a, in a positive way. Like he just, <laughs> he just like, that is the, the thing he portrays. He's very self-deprecating. He's very yeah. understanding of his limitations. Like as a guy. Yeah. Yes. That's like, that's what I want right. in like a friend. But then I right. look at that as a leader of men of guys who have played at the highest level, who have been internationals played in world cups. And yeah. seeing like how how do they buy into that dynamic? I can see Ted Cudi Pietro being like, yeah, but Christian Benteke be like, who is this guy that we that we <laughs> signed? What is this about? What what do you what do you think I'm about, about, about that idea? Well, I mean, I would I would ho- I mean, this is this is something that's now happening in all types of sports, right? The notion of Sean McVay or Michael McDaniel it, it, in the NFL, right? I mean, these are these guys forty. The, the whole right. idea of of you know, you have to look like Bum Phillips in order to be, uh, you know, you have to be George Allen, right? In order, that's just for you guys, in order to coach a team is not necessarily the case anymore. And I would I would hope that a player like Benteke would be a true professional. He's played in the Premier League for many, many years. And it's like, this is the gaffer. Well, okay, let's go. Um you know, if I'm Troy, I'm wrapping my arms around Benteke and being like, "Hey, man, like, I what do you need? I'm so, <laughs> I'm so. Well, not just not just that, but like, I'm so glad you're here, and I'm really going to rely on you to help get the message out, right? Everyone looks up to you and respects you, and you know, kind of, kind of a, uh, you know, a Roy Kent, uh, Ted Lasso kind of a, <laughs> you know, I, I kind of need you to figure. They're like, oh boy. What was the what was the great line? God, he's going to be so mad when we win him over, kind of thing. Um, yeah. But I I don't want to paint Lassane as Ted Lasso. I, I think that's unfair because um, because whether or not I mean can understand why why the comparisons would be there. But he's a guy in, in a hurry as well, and he's he's an ambitious guy, and um, you know he. I got to spend an afternoon at the training facility over the summer with a couple of Troy's college buddies from Charleston who happened to be at the training facility. Among them was like Kyle Martino's brother was there. And and they were all, you know, they're in their late 30s and early 40s. And they all were just like, this guy was born to coach. Like he just was born to do it. I mean, listen, it looks like a strong wind would knock him over. Right. I mean, I don't know if you've (laughs) met him yet. He's, he's not a large human being. He's, he is, uh, small and slight and in shape for sure. But it's like, 
he's not he doesn't necessarily have to be super loud but he's just like really smart and he really cares about his his players his people and maybe it is apt i don't know but i i think i think the the right i think he's got certainly the leadership stuff down and the real question is is as you said can he win over kind of grizzled veterans and and who will decide that they want to buy in and want to play for him i think the other thing that took me by I wouldn't say surprise, but I, it was noticeable, is that DC United's been a team that has mostly looked down on the lower leagues, has not looked to them for players, has not looked to them for co- coaching, has been, other than Ben Olsen, the idea has been like, we want yeah. a, an external, yeah. innovative guy from a different, from a better position, basically, coming down to, mm-hmm. to where we're at. And I assumed after the hire, I was like, oh, they're going to hire somebody with a lot of experience, an MLS vet, to be one of his assistants, so that he's got some... And they have just bought, they have said, no, no, we're, we're going all in on this like second division to first division momentum here. Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I don't know if I've been sort of damaged by DC United's perspective on USL championship to like say, <laughs> I feel like we could do better. Can't we, can't we do better? Uh, but was there any kind of perspective from Red Bull fans as sort of what his pedigree, obviously he came as an assistant, so he was around right. the team for a while. So that maybe not. But yeah. I'm just curious if sort of his pedigree was ever a, a matter of discussion for, for Red Bull fans as he took over. Well, I think that Red Bull fans, you know, again, think about what we had had. I mean, we had Chris Armis, again, who who won us the last shield and then famously got the tactics wrong in the playoffs. And Red Bull fans to this day talk about the second half of that game, all of that game. And um to, to refresh your listeners' memories, uh, Kamar Lawrence was hurt. They played Connor late at left back. And because all we did was press, uh, Armis said, that's just what they'll be expecting. And he, they didn't press, and they tore us apart, and we lost 3-0 in the first leg. And that team at the time had set the record for most points in a regular season in MLS history. And it was right there for us. And so Armis was – and then led us through a year and a half of, uh, you know, in the wilderness. And then they brought in um, Bradley Carnell, who was on the staff of uh, an Armist staff and seemed to perk the, the team up pretty nicely. And they were responding to him. And then they decided to, you know, call home to, 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 to Austria and bring this guy who, you know, he was certainly effective, but he didn't, you know, he wasn't a natural English speech speaker and he was translating in real time. Like he, you could see, and, you know, to, to his defense, it was during COVID, his family was here, his family was there. It was, it wasn't a, at the end of the, he lost the team. And so to have a young guy who didn't make strange idioms come to life during press <laughs> conferences and could talk to you like you were a real person. And at least from, you know, from, for me in the local press corps, it was like handshake. How are you? What's going on? Tell me a little bit about who you are. I mean, he was very quick to put people at ease and he became very likable. And, you know, I think there's something to be said for, you know, we have these lower leagues, the players in them, you know, I, I think we, maybe not on, we haven't talked about it, but like there seems to be somewhat of a barrier, right? Whether it's sort of corporate edict or not about about USL players moving up and playing in MLS, why shouldn't they? And why shouldn't coaches, right? I mean, this is what this is. And... So I think it was such a refreshing change from, yes, the boys, uh, they have to feel it in the chest and uh, they have to be on the limit to a real person that, you know, doesn't sound like a overheated Arnold Schwarzenegger impersonation. So, um, you know, and that said, we've got our German coach who we're about to meet next Friday for the first time and it'll be back to this. So we're, yeah. we're, we're moving from Scouse noises. That was the big <laughs> meme. They did. A, I don't know if you saw the YouTube video where they were translating. Wayne was just talking about something. And it just said Scouse right. noises at the bottom. So that's <laughs> yeah. That's a little bit uh, you, yeah. A little bit, <laughs> Go ahead. Little, little little bit different. A little bit different. Um, I, I did want to ask, and and I think a lot of fans. I, I feel like when 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 the same was hired, 
there was a lot of talk, a lot of maybe some criticism about, well, he, and I feel like, and maybe this, I'm sure this is completely unfair, but I feel like as soon as, as soon as like, as soon as a coach goes to Red Bull, it's like, they're labeled as like this, like Red Bull, they're, they're from the Red Bull Academy and it's like the coaching Academy or whatever, like they, that they right. play they only know they, how to they, play one way. They're right. the Jesse Marsh style of press. I guess my right. question was, did you ever, I mean, I understood, you know, he didn't get any, any help in the off season. He had the no. players he had. They had built all the season to play the Red Bull pressing style. But did you yeah. ever get any sort of sense that, you know, he either tried to change things or he maybe changed things up tactically that showed uh, maybe a little astuteness in, in changing the way Red Bull played that season? Yeah. So the for the first answer is yes. Um, the second answer is as much as the notion is that you come out of the Red Bull pressing coaching academy thing and you're all clones to each other, we've been told over and over again is, is not the case. And that while they will always, you know, Jesse Marsh's famous <laughs> first word to the Red Bull fan base at the Mike Petke, why did you fire Mike Petke presser was, this is an energy drink, okay? And we're going to play like an energy drink and everyone just lot like, like, no, don't <laughs> like you might say, like, don't say it, like think it and do it, but please don't remind us what, just don't do that. So um, I'll tell you that Troy, when he took over, right, you, you know, 10 games into the 23 season, he understood that the strength of the team was always going to be in their ability to press for the entire length of the field. But he also said, if we're going to succeed, and at this time, the team had scored something like six goals in 11 games. I mean, he, he basically said, we simply must become comfortable with the ball at our feet, right? I mean, the whole high press uh, philosophy is – if you get turnovers in the attacking third, it's you're so much closer to the goal. It's just so much easier to score. Why doesn't everybody <laughs> do this? Right. But if you have players that just are trying to make every match a car crash, which is funny speaking to you, know, you guys at DC, because we've had some of the most unwatchable car crash <laughs> matches over the last five oh, years. Goodness. I mean, just ugh, uggers. But, um, you know, yes, un under Lassane, the team became more adept at holding the ball, creating opportunities. And a great example of that, although now he's departed, is Luquinhas, who had come to the team the year before, started off with a bang. He's a guy of short stature and opposing defenses said, well, if we kick the crap out of this guy, he's not going to be terribly effective. And that's what they did. And he disappeared. And so... Well, and I'm sure that under Struber, it was just like, move it forward, just move it forward. That's all I want you to do is move it forward. And he's a creative player by nature. And down the stretch, he created and scored some magnificent goals. He he actually has created dribbling, uh, led to the penalty kick on decision day against Nashville that allowed John Tolkien's penalty kick to send him to the playoffs. So um, that's just one example. You know, players like... Um, uh, like Frankie Amaya, who obviously has the ability to go forward. John Tolkien, as I mentioned earlier, who absolutely gets forward from the left back position and gets into the play. Um, you know, I, I spoke with Lissane on a number of occasions who had nothing to praise for Jamai, but basically was just like, look, if he's comfortable with the ball on his feet and he feels that he can, um, you know, be an impact on, on, on the attack as long as he gets back and but plays his defensive responsibilities, we absolutely need him as part of the attack. And so, you know, I, I would say that he is not, um, you know, a monolithic, uh, guy, but uh, from a from a playing standpoint, but uh, from a strategy standpoint, but he he understands. You know, Red Bull is always going to play this way. Uh, sadly, you know, for better or for worse, whether you believe in it or you don't. And, um, but each individual coach has the freedom to do what they want. And I think that Lassane coming to this team will look at his pieces and decide that how best to go about it. I mean, he certainly wasn't that in New Mexico, right? When that's mm -hmm. not what he was. We had a question from one of our listeners about sort of what type of players seem to thrive under Lassane. And obviously you mentioned part of that is young players are given opportunity yep. to shine. You didn't get to see a transfer window where he actually got to get his type of players. I'm wondering if you see his type of players more as a uh, culture. Like I feel like the thing, obviously the, it's early days. The conversation is about buy-in culture. Wanting yeah, yeah, to be yeah. here. Do you think that is 
one of the lenses or one of the major lenses he's going to look at as he looks to build his team. And obviously I think Ellie, uh, Ellie McKay is, I think he's calling the show. I think he's pulling the strings on that. I think that was part of this hire was sort of like, I'll do this part. You do this part. I'll yeah. allow you to do this. So I do this. But do you think, uh, Without without having to know, like ima- imagine you got to experience a transfer window with him, knowing what you know about him and and, and the, the type of performances he coaxed out of the players you had. What type of players do you think that he would go after if you looked at just like an MLS? It's hard. It's kind of a hard question to answer, but it's all right. It's what, okay. I'll give it a shot. Um, you know, first of all, you know, consider that you know at at Red Bulls, it's really the head of sport and the sporting director's job. Like they they really delineate it, and um, you know they have a you know they have a growing sporting organization as they call it because they're pretentious Europeans um, <laughs> about, you know, the, the quality and the talent and the tactics and the, you know, the signing and the coach, it's like, here's your, here's your tools. You go to work now. Um, you know, New York desperately needed quality up top. Um, desperately, desperately, desperately. And so what did they do? They went and got uh, a two, 19 and 22 year old Colombians one they signed who was like a right back and the other I think was a midfielder or a forward he was only on loan so I don't think he got a point while he was here the the point being I think he understood where his strengths were and it's hard to really say as you said John because you know he, he was here for two thirds of a season. Right. right. But, um, you know, they who had a lot of strength in the back, they had strengths at the sixes. It really was creating goal scoring opportunities and watching them just erase Charlotte FC in the, in the eight, nine play in game during the playoffs, they dropped five goals on them. Elias Manuel, you know, a somewhat maligned 20 year old Brazilian striker had a hat trick. It was the first playoff hat trick for, for this franchise since back in the days before they, were named, called this. Um, and so, you know, watching that game was really the culmination of his time with us, even though they went on to play two kind of tough games against Cincinnati and wound up being a little bit short, which is totally fine. But um, they, uh, you know, they, they scored five goals in a home playoff game and it wasn't close. I think it, the final score was like five, three, but they were up three nil and four one. And I have never in all my days, and I have been here for all of the days, um, being at a playoff game and being like, we're going to win. <laughs> this is great. Like there was no drama. No there was no pressure. There were no offsides on a penalty kick attempt. There was no <laughs> red cards. There was no s- snow shovels. There was none of that. It was just <laughs> like we came out from the opening whistle and kicked the crap out of them and won the game. And it was like I, every day this, this, is, because, you know, consider – like for the past five years, it's like every game is is literally, you know, taking days and weeks off your life because it's so close all the time. It's losing in the most incomprehensible ways, which, you know, you guys are a part of that history. And mm-hmm. it's like just to have one shining moment, as, you know, CBS says, to just be like, we won and we were better today and it wasn't close and this is awesome. Uh, and so that's, you know, if I had one thing to thank Charlie Lusain for, it would be that. And of course, knowing, you know, for him, he was like, it's great. It's in the past. Now it's Cincinnati. We're not going to celebrate. Yeah, this is how we should be playing all the time. And you're just like, you know, you want to strap on the, the, the sandals and the shield and say, let's go, man. Let's I'm right behind you. Ted, I think if he scores, if he if, if we score five goals in a home playoff game, they're going to build him a statue. Yeah. Right. After, <laughs> after the last decade, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna give him naming rights to the stadium. I'll take a I'll take a player uh, who's onside from from midfield um, and mm. maybe and maybe related to Ernie Stewart. <laughs> I had to do it to you, Mark. I'm sorry. I'm after, sorry, Ted. There was after the no after this last decade <laughs> way that he was onside. <laughs> he wasn't in the camera. It was like he was on another planet. God damn it. Uh, uh, Did you guys win that year? Was that 04? That was, was that 04. The yep, that was, buddy. God. I remember that. <laughs> 20 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Oh, yeah, but, that's uh, really great. Uh, but uh, Mark, again, um, I thank you so much for for coming on. I really do appreciate yeah. it. You're always you're always a fantastic sport. Um, you're, you're getting me excited and uh, gassed up, maybe for the for the Troy Lesain era, uh, which could either be it's either you're being genuine and it's great, or you actually think he's awful and you're just you're just punishing <laughs> a DC fan when it all goes south. I'm not sure which. No, I'm kidding. Sleep Ranger. Mark is truly for those those listening. Mark is truly. Uh, Mark is truly a really genuine person and, and, uh, and, and really always excellent to come on. And I really appreciate, um, you've been doing it for 15 years. I think you've grown significantly, but you're always, you're always there to, to come and, and be on our show and really appreciate all. Uh, and, and congrats on all the years you've been doing this. It's, I know it's, it's tough to, I've some days I'm sure after a game, you don't want to get up and do it. I know I have it. So <laughs> you're really, you're really awesome. Um, Thank you for the kind words. And uh, I wish you guys nothing but success unless you were playing us. And that, and in that case, you must fail miserably in the most painful way possible. Hey man, we're, we're waiting. I mean, you guys are spending some money, bringing some players in a new direction. Maybe this is, maybe we'll look back on this as the moment that the Atlanta cup came back and, is finally getting the the treatment it deserves for for the legacy that it is. So the kids um, today don't know, man. They don't yeah, know. They don't. They don't. I keep no. hoping. I'm hoping. You know, maybe we'll finally have a game on a Saturday instead of a Wednesday. So. What the hell was that? <laughs> what is that? I have no idea, man. I, I don't get it anymore. That's the league office really trying to push that Philly Union uh, rivalry over this one. Like, what if what if your games were Tuesday at three in the morning? What if what, what if we did that so no one ever traveled or watched it or went to it? So uh, I was at. Uh, I know you guys are closing up. I was at the yeah. game um, at Audi when uh, Bradley scored his hundredth goal, and it stood up for the whole night. I remember, there was like two hours of thunderstorms before the game, <laughs> and the whole concourse at Audi, which was like barely open, it was open for like three weeks. Everything flooded. There was so it was horrible, and uh, and the bus ride home was atrocious. But um, uh, I'll always have that. So yeah, yeah, we're, we brought we're, the. We brought the flooded concourses over from RFK and put them into Audi just as you feel at home, <laughs> no matter where you are. I think that's the, what we did. The craziest thing about that was like the lowest point on the concourse wasn't where the sewer grate was. Like the sewer grate was like <laughs> like 18 inches above the lowest point on the concourse. And it was like, well, that's good. Someone thought that out. That's awesome. That's what happens when they build your stadium on a poaches poaches stamp on top of an electrical generator or whatever the hell we did. So. Yeah, and <laughs> and no roof. I'm looking at pictures of Omaha Stadium, saying, "Oh man, look at that full roof oh, covering all the that's fans." Beautiful, <laughs> Ted. If we've spent as much money as we spent on Audi Field in Omaha, we would it would be made of gold and it'd yeah. be it, le- yeah. levitating. <laughs> it'd be the Taj Mahal. Yeah, it would be. Mark, again, thank you so much. Um, go ahead and drop. Uh, people want to listen, maybe uh, to to gain some analysis. Uh, talk. Tell the good people where they can find you. I mean, I can't imagine that's going to happen, but the <laughs> show is called Seeing Red, and it, it's available on all platforms that you can shake a stick at, except for the TikTok. The, it's not good for the kids, but you could find it at, at Seeing Red NY, uh, and that's how you'll get to us. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's always good. To, it's always good to keep up on your enemies. So I, I, I still subscribe and still check in on occasion. So you, you know, keep Thanks, your en- know your enemy is what I always say. So <laughs> <laughs> you betcha. Mark, thank, thank you again, guys. Oh, thank you all so so much for listening. If you're listening to this right now, you are listening on our special uh, Patreon feed. Uh, maybe this show will be out in the future, but if you want to join, join our Patreon, patreon.com slash argue refugees, you get access to great content like this, where we dive into, uh, you know, world. And you also get, you know, some Thursday, Friday shows when we're on breaks or when, you know, during the off season. So it's definitely worth supporting the show. Thank you guys so, so much for listening. We will catch you guys uh, in a while. Vamos. Vamos.